So Ben, when we think of um, stretch sense, yeah. uh, this is really a sort of a cutting edge sort of a product. Just just describe uh, what it does and how you came came about the idea. Yeah. Okay. So the um, the basic idea is we want to make it really easy to measure human body motion, right? So the body is a soft structure and it, it moves around in very complicated ways. And if we want to measure that, maybe for sports training, for um, recovery after injury, you know, or surgery, or maybe for augmented reality, if we want to track the motions of the body is very difficult to do that in a portable, unobtrusive and comfortable manner with conventional technology. So the idea behind our stretch sensors is they're soft pieces of um, plastic, I've got one uh, here, soft pieces um, of uh, rubbery elastic material, it's very very stretchy, it's very comfortable, very conformable, you can see I can just wrap it around my finger there. Um, and that can track body motion, it can track deformations and tell you how you're moving um, for all those applications I meant before. In a very precise way. Absolutely. It's key for it to be precise because if it's not precise and reliable, then any application that you build on it is, is doomed to failure, right? It's like uh, if you tried to go driving down the street with your eyes closed or kind of, you know, fuzzed up or something. Um, so the basic technology we have here is we have a stretchy sensor. We have a Bluetooth transmitter, so I'll just plug the Bluetooth transmitter in. And um, everything in the world has an app these days. All right, there we go. Let's calibrate it. So what you can see here is a soft, stretchy sensor. Um, and when we stretch it, the bar graph moves. And so this is, this is really, really exciting for someone who wants to measure the body. So for example, we could stick it on the knee. Mm -hmm. Right. And very quickly, you get good, precise measurement of body motion. And therefore, uh, not only for sports training and so forth, but um, you know, remedial, um, th you know, therapy, uh, yeah. all of that. That sort of opportunity exists as well too. A absolutely. So if you think about um, healthcare at the moment, at the moment, say say you have a injury or you go through some surgery and you've got to do an exercise. So take that knee movement that I just said there. Mm. So say your physio says, "Okay, Ben, um, you've destroyed your knee. Uh, we've fixed it. Now I want you to do this motion here uh, ten times a day." Okay. So you say, "Yes, yes, yes. I'm a good patient. I go home." But then, how do I know? How do I remember what movement was it? Was it that much? Was it was it that much? Was it that much? Um, how does the physio know that I've done the exercise, <laughs> right? So it's a little more information. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And on top of that, um, as I get better, as I recover from my injury, how do we track that recovery and how to improve? So okay, today Ben want to do this. Well, tomorrow I want to do that, and then on you know. Saturday, I want to do. I want to do this. So you can imagine having a sensor just strapped there on the knee, and away you go. So it's amazing what you can do once you can measure something. You can enable all sorts of new things, and I think um, healthcare is a very big one, especially in-home healthcare. So speeding up recovery times, um, empowering patients, empowering care providers, um, and really driving down costs. Because if you keep people out of the clinic and out of hospital, you can save a lot of money. R&D, uh, significant investment. How, how long has it taken you to get to this point? Yeah, so we've been doing work in this technology for uh, since 2006, I think. So, what's that, seven, eight, nine, lo a long time, um, seven years. Um, we did that as part of the biomedics lab at the University of Auckland here, so in the, the Auckland Bioengineering Institute, and we were working with this, this sort of underlying technology, which we call artificial muscles, uh, for that whole time. So these things can generate power, they can move things, they can um, exhibit basic electronic properties, so you could do lots of cool things, especially in robotics and soft prosthetics and that kind of area. Um, the sensor technology is, is one aspect of it which we decided was very close to market. We had a lot of feedback from potential customers who said, hey, could you measure um, you know, this, that or the other thing? Could you make a sensor? And we kept on kind of ignoring them until one day we sort of said, hey, wait a second, all these people want sensors. So we took that sort of know-how, that, that technical capability that we had, and then we really focused it and refined it down. Um, worked all Christmas, um, this last Christmas, building the sensors, developing the circuits, making the App, we learned how to write apps, um, and then we started selling it. Did it come out of your, your PhD research though? With, with, when, when you were looking around in the space, uh, yeah, did, is that definitely. kind of when you when you identified the opportunity? Yeah, it, it's actually that, that, that twice I owe um, my PhD. So, um, in the first instance, yes, we learned how to work with this technology. We learned how to fabricate things. We developed clever algorithms for doing sensing and um, these structures. 
Um, but the other thing that happened at our PhD is we actually started doing contract work, commercial work. So we started making high voltage electronics for people, we started making demonstration devices, and we got a taste for shipping product. We got a taste, very, very high tech stuff, very, very um, cutting edge um, contract research to big customers, um, but it, shipping product nonetheless. It always boils down to putting something in a box and saying, there we go, and hoping, right? <laughs> That's what it always comes back to. Um, and so we got a taste for doing that. We had some epic failures, we had some great successes, and so during the PhD it wasn't just the technology, which of course is very critical because without technology we wouldn't have this, but it was also the taste for commercialization, the taste for doing that. And you kind of get this sort of thrill when someone actually gives you money and pays you for something entirely new on the world, on the planet that you've created, and they really want it badly and it's solving their problems, and that, that's the biggest rush. Um, this is bringing the kind of the thrill of the sale with the thrill of the technology together. And that's, that's fantastic. So how did you go about validating the proposition? Who, who did you talk to and, and how did you establish the premise for, for uh, the idea? For, for the product, uh, we sold it. <laughs> so, so we, um, like I said, we were talking to, talking to customers, talking to, well, I should say they were potential customers at this point, and they were interested in sensors. So uh, it took a leap of faith. I think, um, I, I'm not sure, maybe there's some people who are lucky, but I think probably all good startups or companies start at some point with a leap of faith, and then they're followed by a series of leaps of faith as you as you go along. But the leap for us was, okay, people have told us they're interested in sensors, but will they actually part with money? You know, will they actually give us some money? And um, I thought, well, we're now in our lives. So so I we founded StretchSense um, myself along with Todd Gisby and Ian Anderson. We're the, we're the three um, active founders. So Ian is associate professor up at the lab and Todd is CTO. Um, so Todd and myself, we worked you know, all, all Christmas with occasional help from Ian when he could get away from, from the lab. Um, and we got this product out there. We got it we got it done. And then we got the validation. So so we built it. Well, we, we talked to people. They said they wanted it. We trusted them. We built it. And then we started selling it. And what's been the reaction? Um, very, very varied. It depends on the industries. Um, for some people, it's, you know, you sit down, you show them the device, and they open their wallet on the spot. Like it's some some people, it's that easy to sell, right? It's this piece of technology they've looked for for years. They've never had it before, and you've got it. Mm-hmm. Obvious. Give me money. You know that's that's how it works. They they you know give me the product, give me the money, off it goes. Other people um, have extreme enthusiasm about the long term prospects, but they want to see mass production, right? They're thinking of you know consumer mass market, all that, and then it's a more kind of softly, softly because you, they you know, they don't just jump in boots and all. Um, one of the things we've found about selling um, a stretch sensor like this is that it's a, it's a key, it's a door opener, mm-hmm. because if you go around, so, so this represents the distillation of a lot of intellectual property, and if you're a university or um, even a big organisation and you're trying to sell your IP, one of the problems you have is that the minimum deal size has to be quite large, right? If you've spent, I don't know, how many hundreds of thousands of dollars in an IP portfolio, you're not going to do an IP deal for a thousand dollars, right? You're not. You know, it just wouldn't cover a fraction of the lawyer costs to get it done. But if you make a simple evaluation product that has the distillation of that IP into it, and you sell someone, you can now do that on a minimum kind of transaction basis. So 850 bucks, that's well within the discretionary spending of, of any engineer working in these fields. They buy it, then we have a conversation about customization, right. then we have a conversation about production, then we have a conversation about IP. And it gets it the other way around, because I think if you start with intellectual property and you start trying to sell this big portfolio to someone straight away, it's okay if they're very large and they have a very established need, but for all the small players out there, you just can't do a deal. So that that's actually what you've done, isn't it? You can you can go to your website and you can buy this unit for eight hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So yeah, um, you go to the website, you get a couple of these sensors, you get a transmitter, you get access to our app on the Google Play Store, and it's eight hundred and fifty US dollars. We put it in US dollars because a lot of our customers are offshore, right? Yeah. It keeps it simple for them. Which also creates an, like an open innovation platform, doesn't exactly it? Where right. other other people can can innovate opportunities, which then obviously creates a, a benefit for you down the track. 
great. Yeah, so one of the coolest things I think about innovation is how it builds on itself, right? So we've done some innovation and then we've consolidated it and that now enables people to do science, to do their own innovation, to their own technology development on top of that, whether it's new types of wearable technologies, whether it's looking at the science of how bringing care into the home can improve patient outcomes, whether it's you know new ways to interact with portable electronic devices. There's so many different things that were in theory possible, but because the technology hadn't been consolidated, hadn't been sort of uh, crystallized out of the sort of IP firmament that it came from, you couldn't actually do that ongoing innovation. Because, I mean, I think innovation is, is consolidation, I think it's curiosity, and I think it's need. So need is the customers or someone having a problem, it could be you, it could be someone else, saying we need to solve this problem. Um, curiosity is it's got to be fun. You've got to be, you know, doing it for the love of it, and and you know, otherwise, <laughs> and passionate and passionate. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly right. But the the coolest thing I think is that the bit that makes it exponential isn't the need and isn't the curiosity. It's the way it builds on itself. It's that consolidation process. Um, and so what this represents to us is okay that we've been working in this field. Lots of people been working in this field. Mm -hmm. Like there's, you know, it's not just our lab. There was labs all around the world. Um, but no one actually took that and crystallized it into a platform like a Lego brick, you know, that you can then put into and start making your house, you know, and that's what's really cool about this. What, what have you learned about the commercialization process and particularly about, about having to raise capital because you've got skin in the game yourself, haven't you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what have I learned about commercialization? I think, I think uh, cash flow. Um, I would say to any anyone who's going to start a company cash flow will consume you you will stay up at night you will dream about cash flow you will you'll make these nice little charts we show how you're going to go bankrupt in three weeks time unless you get a sale um, you will plot your finances and they'll do this hopefully they do that but they will do this um, you a really fun thing which I think from from a kind of learning point of view is that every month the issues you face are different and the scale goes up so at the beginning we would be gambling with 500 bucks you know should we buy that piece of equipment should we do that marketing thing should we do this that you know whatever should we buy enough stock 500 bucks then it was like a thousand dollars then it was five thousand then it's like you know these ten thousand dollar gambles and you start to you have to, and that changes like monthly. The kind of money you worry about just goes up and up and up and up. And so that's been a really fascinating learning process, just the financials. And then how you have to live and breathe that, but it still has to only be 5% of what you worry about because it's, you know, finding customers is getting out there. R&D. Yeah, R&D. Yeah, uh, you know, production, scaling issues, stuff, training issues. There's legal issues. You've got, you know, the, the New Zealand um, legislative environment is getting better, but I think there are a lot of protections put in place because of financial um, issues probably in the 80s. I'm not sure I was born in the 80s, but <laughs> but back then. And But these have ramifications, and they're in there for a good reason, and you have have to navigate them right you have to you can't break the law um, so you bring in all of this into one and you try to create an organization and then you have to relearn that every month because every month is different the you know the scale of all those pieces and they all have to still interact and work that keeps changing all the way what about the decision that you made to come back to New Zealand? Because you did spend some time offshore, and yeah. uh, somebody with your kind of qualifications and and you know in the space, a uh, lot of opportunity offshore. So why the decision to, to come back to New Zealand? And what are your thoughts around the innovation space generally? Yeah, um, so that's a big question. <laughs> um, I think the, f the first point is uh, in New Zealand produces far more PhDs um, or even high level um, education educated people than it can can employ. Um, at the moment so you've got like for, for us like myself and my co-workers we had two options one is is big industry we can go overseas we can work in big industry the other one is academia both of those options mean we have to more or less leave the country maybe for a while maybe we can come back for example academia you can get some experience and come back, but you still have to leave. Now, we didn't want to leave. Um, we've got families here. We think we, we feel like we owe something to the country that's got us here. So, well, what's the third option? Do we go work at, at Macca's? No, we start companies, right? And that's, that's what's going to change it. Um, I think on the innovation ecosystem, I think New Zealand is getting better, uh, but one of the problems it has is the service providers, the, um, the capital markets, the, the legal systems are not well set up and structured for very small players with, with huge upside potential, right? So you tend to get cost structures that, that are very front loaded, like you'll go to someone, they'll provide a service and they'll charge you through the nose instead of you know trying to build a relationship for the longer term game. So I think it's, it's obviously very individual 
individual. You can find some people who um, will try and you know choke the life out of you, um, and there are others who will, who will pay it forward. And I think New Zealand needs more of the pay it forward because if we build an ecosystem where we all help each other, in the long run, that means we'll all get much better off. And I, I see that. I just came back from a sales trip in the states. Um, I saw that over there. The ecosystem, you know, it's it's all. We see it as being all cutthroat and you know competitive in that, and at one level it kind of is, but at another level it's far more supportive, um, and people are prepared to say, "Hey, I know a guy who can help you and do this," and "Hey, have you tried this?" and and there's there's way more of that going on, and so, so it's collaborative, very collaborative, yeah, because. The thing is, right, if you don't participate in that um, ecosystem, you will lose out. You will be, you know, doors will be closed to you. And in New Zealand, this ecosystem is is starting out and it's growing. And I guess my my final point on, on all of this is um, I see a lot of academics and I see a lot of people um, in, in the R&D space talking about commercialization, mm-hmm. right? They talk about it, they talk about it, they talk about it, talk about it. I used to talk about it. But people who do it, are rare and we need people who do it we need and we need that to not be rare we need that to be the normal we need people to like actually say you know what i am going to quit my job for you i can come back and get a job back here you know life we're in a welfare state it's not that risky right Mm. start it up do it try it get it out there um because i can complain about legal issues and capital markets and these things but the reality is that will only change from the bottom up it will only change because a whole bunch of companies just keep on every day. The bank keeps seeing another startup that says, hey, I want a, a, a loan that's insecure at a reasonable interest rate. Or, hey, um, I know you're a big firm, legal firm, but I want you to give me the services and we'll, we'll agree that if we're really successful, we'll come back to you. Or whatever it is, right? Every day they need to be saying, no, 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 oh, maybe, okay, fine. And, and, and then that will change it. Um, so, so on that in that space, it's often you know people say the capital issue is one thing that holds back. I mean, has that been an issue for you? No, I don't. I don't think so. I mean, we we just started selling product. We put our own money in. Um, we did secure a small amount of angel investment, which was helpful um, uh, in in July. Um, but it, it, you know, it honestly, if you're selling something people want, mm. you you'll be, you know, you'll be okay. Yeah, the, the cap, the capital will find itself. I, I think so because yeah. the thing, capital is a, a double-edged sword. Um, you you have an idea, right? And and let's say your idea is you want to make a stretchy sensor to take over the world. Great, that's your idea. Now. Um, if you've got capital, you might, instead of after two months trying to sell it to someone and finding out what's wrong with it, and believe me, there were things wrong with our first product. We, we went back and forth with customers. Oh, sorry, we didn't think you'd do that, and so on and so forth. You, instead of doing that, you say, oh, I've got all this money to set up a production line. <laughs> And so you go and you take that money and you spend it all on setting up your production line or filing your patents or whatever the hell it is that you want to do. And then when you actually get to market, with your, okay, I've now got shiploads of sensors ready to push out into the market, that's when you find out about that tiny little problem that you would have seen had you just tried to sell it. Right. So I think I think capital is, um, it has its place. It's very, very important, especially around protecting cash flow. That's the one area where, you know, if you sell a sensor to a customer, you'll find out very quickly that they'll probably not pay you for three months. Mm-hmm. They will pay you, you know, they will, you know, they'll honor their debt, but you know, in their own time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and are you going to assert? <laughs> no, <laughs> you're a tiny company. They're on the other side of the world. You, you can't even afford the plane ticket. You know, um, that's where I think in the very early stages, capital, and that's what it really is about. I think it's about cash flow. It's about allowing you to take the necessary gambles. But if you give someone too much money, they'll take unnecessary gambles, and it actually gets worse. Once you've established, though then I think you need capital for growth because then it becomes, once you have, you know, okay, people are buying our sensors and it turns out they want them at this price point and to do that we need to sell this many, therefore we need to get this equipment. That's when I think um, the kind of second round comes up. And just finally, what's your hope for, for, for the company at a very early stage, and just kind of, um, you know, finding your wings and starting to fly? Uh, where, where do you hope to take it in the future? Um, well, <laughs> we, we want it to be really successful. I mean, that's that's the, the bottom line, right? We're not in this to lose. We're not in this for, for small um, opportunities. We want it to be, you know, a superstar mega hit. That's what we want the company to be. Um, as far as uh, technologically, what I'd like to see is I'd like to see this in, in, in the home, uh, whether it's for entertainment, whether it's for uh, medicine, whether it's for sports performance, whatever. I want to see this in the hands of ordinary people because that's when um, it's going to actually create the most value 
value and help the most people and actually drive kind of very high level um, social um, benefits. Um, financially, yeah, we want to sell a lot of them, <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, and I think part of that is that will enable us to start continuing pushing the ecosystem ourselves, right? If we get into a position where we can start supporting this kind of stuff, then that's that's really good. And I think as many people that we can have with successful companies, the better it will be for all of us. So, yeah, I success, 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 and success. That's what we want.